To round off my trilogy of giant diesel flops from three different builders, find out the answer to why this strange diesel locomotive with so many wheels even existed. At the end of World War II, America's railroads were seeking to dieselize their highest priority passenger trains as diesel locomotives by that point had proved they were more efficient than steam locomotives. Since the war was over, wartime restrictions were now lifted, allowing railroads to go back to their old stylish images post-conflict. Only one issue. Almost four years of long and heavy wartime freight trains had taken a massive toll on their right-of-ways to the point the rails were worn out and beaten to a near pulp. Conventional diesel locomotives like EMD's 4-axle F units and even 6-axle E units were found to be rough riders on such worn-out rails. Meanwhile, electric locomotives like the Pennsylvania Railroad's GG1s proved to be smooth riders on even the most worn-out tracks thanks to having all their wheels grouped closely together. This provided such locomotives with smooth riding characteristics, since grouping them together meant a lower axle load. A lower axle load meant the weight didn't compress the rails down as deeply as typical diesels would. It also meant there was constant pressure on the rails instead of any sudden brake periods of, say, half a second or even a tenth of a second, which would make a locomotive ride the rails more smoothly, and thus make the ride for everyone on board much more smooth. The Seaboard Airline was most desperate for a smooth riding passenger locomotive not powered by steam. The obvious answer would be to just buy an electric locomotive with wheel arrangements like the GG1. But they could not afford complete electrification of its system. So they had to go on to plan B. Find a diesel locomotive that could ride just as smoothly on rough track as electrics like the GG1 instead. It seemed like a lot to ask for, but luckily for them, they got an answer from the most unlikely builder possible, Baldwin. Baldwin had been making diesel locomotives starting in 1939, but they were just switchers and road switchers, and had never attempted a road diesel locomotive before. Back in 1943, Baldwin constructed a massive prototype 6,000 horsepower diesel locomotive with a strange 2-D plus D-2 wheel arrangement. The prototype proved to be a smooth rider on worn-out rails like those at the end of World War II, but was found to be too powerful due to being less flexible and redundant than conventional ABA lash-ups from EMD or ALCO, totaling 6,000 horsepower, with 2,000 in each unit. Baldwin eventually dismantled the prototype following its tour run in 1944, and spent the next year refining the design to create its ultimate answer to what the Seaboard Airline and other railroads were wanting at the end of World War II. The resulting answer was released in December of 1945 in the form of what was designated as the Baldwin DR-12-8-1500-2, but better known as the Centipede due to the high number of axles grouped closely together like the legs of centipedes. It was a diesel unlike anything the world had ever seen. Regarding technical specifications, the DR stood for Diesel Road, 12 denoting 12 axles, 8 denoting that 8 of the axles were actually powered, and 1500-2 meant that the Centipede had two engines producing 1500 horsepower each. The refined Centipede still had the unique 2-D plus D-2 wheel arrangement, which, under the white notation, translates to a 4884 meaning it had the exact same wheel arrangement as the Union Pacific Big Boys, as well as electrics like the Little Joes and Great Northern W1s, and was a little longer than a tenderless big boy at 91 and a half feet. But don't let its wheel arrangement intimidate you, because the Centipede was designed for passenger service, unlike the Big Boys, which were designed for pulling freight trains, and one Centipede only had 3,000 horsepower and 102,500 pounds of tractive effort well behind the 6,300 plus horsepower and 135,000 pounds of the big boys. The centipedes also bent through curves more like an electric. But once two centipedes were lashed together, a big boy was totally outdone in tractive effort, but was still a little stronger in horsepower. The car body rode on two massive articulated cast steel half frames cast by general steel castings linked at the middle with a hinged joint with unpowered four-wheel trucks at each end to guide the locomotive through curves for stability at speed, much like steam and older electric locomotives. You could even see it as an E-unit, F-unit hybrid, since it had two engines like an E-unit, but they had the same power output each as the engine in an F-unit. 
It even had the same number of both unpowered and powered wheels as two E units, except in a 4884 wheel arrangement instead of an AAR bogey arrangement. At the time they were built, 3000 horsepower was incredibly powerful for a diesel locomotive. Union Pacific and or DDA 40X fans like me would even consider the Centipede as a 40s equivalent of 60s miles like the DDA 40X and U50 for example. The Centipede definitely rode smoothly on rough track like the GG1s and could do so pulling passenger trains at 100 miles an hour. Their attractive effort was also really impressive for a diesel like that of the 40s and they performed well what they were designed to do. Railroads only had to lash two of these units together to achieve 6,000 horsepower on their passenger trains instead of using three 2,000 horsepower units, thus reducing operating costs and fuel consumption. So, the Centipedes seemed like they were good locomotives at first. They were satisfactory for what Baldwin designed them to do. But, unlike every locomotive I've discussed on the show, it wasn't really the performance that made the Centipedes unsuccessful, but more so their reliability that did. And when I say reliability, I don't necessarily mean that it was a case much like the U50C, which was a horrible performer, but more so maintenance-wise and how these monsters were built. Diesel locomotives are usually built using common assembly lines with standardized procedures, which manufacturers like especially EMD had been using from the get-go. This is a concept that dates back to 1908 and was famously first used in the production of Henry Ford's famous Model T, the first mass-produced car, or car common people could afford, or the first car built like this, but you get the point. Using assembly lines means that each unit is exactly the same as every other unit, reduces construction costs and human labor, and greatly speeds up production. But unlike EMD, Baldwin built the centipedes one at a time, similar to how steam locomotives are built. Building them one at a time ultimately meant that each unit was not a complete mechanical copy like the rest, but instead slightly different from the next being made. The result of which was that the wiring and equipment, more advanced stuff than what Baldwin was used to working with in steam locomotives, was in slightly different spots between each unit. The consequence was that it made routine maintenance on the centipedes very, very complicated. Yeah, something diesel locomotive maintenance crews, especially in these times, do not expect. Because diesels are supposed to be easier to maintain and less complicated than steam locomotives, and should be more advanced in everything, including how they are built. The different placement of the wiring in each centipede kind of beats one major point of them being diesel locomotives, which is just like I said, not being complicated to maintain like steam locomotives. A diesel mechanic knew what to expect when an EMD locomotive came in for maintenance, but when a centipede or other Baldwin diesel came in, well, they were in for a nightmare. If that's not enough, Baldwin also equipped the centipedes, and future diesels too, with pneumatic throttles, which although reduced costs, meant they could not be lashed together with other builders' diesels for multiple unit operation. This also beats another point of them being diesels, which is having the ability to lash multiple of them together while still being capable of all being controlled simultaneously by just one engineer, even if each is made by a different builder, and not one per unit like with steam locomotives. In other words, everything about the centipedes was completely outdated, and unable to compete with that of other builders such as EMD especially, General Electric, and even Alco. The centipedes were like the Japanese battleship Yamato, the largest and most powerful battleship ever built. Both were obsolete machines before they were even finished, the difference being the Yamato wasn't obsolete when construction began, only right before it was finished. The centipedes, on the other hand, were straight up obsolete from the start of production. But the most complaints from the centipedes came, ironically, from Baldwin's loyal customer, the Pennsylvania Railroad, who eventually became fed up with the centipedes being complicated to maintain for its premier passenger trains and derated them to freight and helper service, the latter of which they were not designed for. They were okay in freight service, but when derated to helper service, it didn't work since they were meant to be on the head end of trains, not in the middle or at the rear! The centipedes exerted so much torque and force on the freight cars they were pushing that when on curves, they were prone to jackknifing into the freight cars and derailing them and maybe even themselves. 
The railroad even reduced the horsepower in each unit to 2,500 when they were derailed to freight service, but it didn't automatically mean the jackknifing would go away. In the end, due to Baldwin's obsolete manufacturing technique for the centipedes, only 54 of them were built for just three railroads. 24 for the Pennsylvania, and 14 each for the Seaboard Airline and National Railways of Mexico, or an AM. The remaining two were ordered by Union Pacific, but they soon cancelled the order, and the two units, originally the demonstrator units, were soon scrapped. The other railroads using centipedes were also quick to downgrade them to freight service and re-gear them for it like the Pennsylvania, though not to helper service, thank gosh. The railroads with centipedes eventually rewired them to be mechanically the same as each other, and some had their pneumatic throttles replaced with universal electric designs so that they could be lashed up with other builders' diesels, but by that point, Baldwin's reputation was already tarnished, especially in the eyes of railroads used to smaller but more reliable units from other builders like EMD, Alco, and Fairbanks Morse. Because the railroads had to go through the hassle of fixing these issues by either themselves in-house or sending them to Baldwin to fix. It thus led many to convince others not to buy Baldwin diesels. The Pennsylvania and Seaboard Airline withdrew their units first in the early 1960s, well before Penn Central even formed, and NJM followed in the late 1960s. It's a surprise to some, I guess maybe a few, not so much for everyone else, including me, that no centipedes were preserved, all being scrapped once they were retired. It would also be an understatement seeing the horrible financial status of American railroads by that point. To sum up the centipede, Baldwin had put a great amount of research and development into this giant of the rails, and it did produce a decent locomotive in terms of, well, performance. It rode smoothly on battered track, was a powerful passenger locomotive, and performed well at high speed. It definitely lived up to its customer's expectation in, well, just these regards. The unique wheel arrangement may have been a little inconvenient at first, but they were still able to function properly, and the fuel capacity, despite being limited within the car body, was I guess you could say, okay, maybe not, meh, not a diesel expert completely, still more of a steam expert. But unfortunately, Baldwin's method for manufacturing these things was completely outdated compared to EMD and even ALCO, and it never would have worked that way. Had Baldwin also used more advanced assembly techniques and electric throttles in these things, they would have competed better with EMD. That would have eliminated the issue of each unit being slightly different from each other, simplified routine maintenance by a ton, made the units capable of multiple unit operation with other builders' diesels from the get-go, and thus, overall, made the centipedes, as well as future Baldwin diesels had they also made these same changes I mentioned, more appealing to railroads. To buy. Way more units would have been produced at a much faster rate with lower costs, and more railroads would have tried out the centipede for themselves. The centipedes would have lasted much longer, maybe even into the days of Amtrak and Conrail. But that still doesn't change the fact that the Prime Movers were, no surprise, not as reliable as EMD or ALCO Prime Movers. Duh! Had Baldwin also given it more time, they could have developed a much better freight and helper variant that likely wouldn't be as prone to jackknifing, the former of which would have especially come in handy when passenger train ridership declined in the late 1960s, in the US, which already caused some GG ones to be reassigned to freight service. Maybe Amtrak might have had good luck with the Centipede in its days before the F-40PH had Baldwin done it right. But what makes it worse for me personally about Baldwin doing it wrong with the Centipede is that it also made future diesels with the same obsolete manufacturing technique as the Centipede, which only accelerated its downfall. The Centipede wasn't a failure because it had horrible performance like the Alco Century 855, but because of Baldwin's obsolete manufacturing technique that it used to build these things. And diesels. And since the Centipedes were Baldwin's first attempt at a road diesel locomotive, they were thus tragically the beginning of Baldwin's diesel building problems, and thus the most infamous example of them. Besides, Baldwin really struggled with making diesel locomotives even more than Alco. And even the Centipedes pros still can't stop me from disliking the Centipedes. Well, that concludes my trilogy of big diesel locomotive failures from three different locomotive builders, both present and extinct. Feel free to like this video and subscribe to my channel to see more Railroad Topic videos like this one, and be sure to activate notifications so that you don't miss an upload, assuming you of course have subscribed already. Also check out some of these videos in the annotations and cards to learn more about Centipedes and Baldwin's history with making diesel locomotives. I'm Andrea Lapamers, and I will see you again in the next episode, which will also be talking about another steam locomotive. Thanks for watching.